Welcome everybody back to TSSA Talks. This is a series we're really excited about. It's a partnership with the historic Exit Inn. You can see one of the famous things about the Exit Inn is they have all the names of many of the famous performers who've been here. I'm looking at a Chuck Berry poster across the way. Johnny Cash is back here over my shoulder. The stage here where we did our live interviews uh, has had some amazing performers on it. Uh, this is a partnership between this historic Exit Inn in Nashville, Tennessee, and Tennessee State Soccer Association to bring this TSSA Talks video series to you. We're really excited to be joined today by my guest, Chris Duke. Chris is the National Director of the Olympic Development Program for US Youth Soccer. Uh, he's a colleague of mine, and uh, Chris, I want to welcome you today. Thanks so much for joining us here for TSSA Talks. Uh, thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. Um, excited to be here. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, our, it's really our pleasure to have you. So one of the, the goals of our video series is to, to bring some conversations uh, that, are, that are relevant, we think, in our times. And we really want to shine a light on some communities that are underrepresented uh, throughout U.S. soccer, throughout our world, specifically throughout Tennessee State Soccer Association. With you uh, in your role as a national director of this you know, long-standing uh, traditional program that's been going on in USU soccer as a black man. We feel like your perspective is very warranted and needed and a voice we'd like to hear. So to start, could you give us a little bit of a background on how soccer came to be a part of your life? You and I are of a similar generation and soccer wasn't in everybody's life when we were growing up. How did soccer come to be a part of your life? Uh, Ron, you're absolutely right. I, uh, I grew up in Las Vegas and, um, started soccer when I was nine years old. My next door neighbor, uh, Buck Hawkins, was uh, a kid that introduced me to the game. Uh, soccer wasn't very popular at that time uh, in, in Vegas. And uh, really, uh, it was one of the sports that I really, really um, excelled at at a, at a young age. Um, um, thought I was a little bit athletic. People thought I was athletic, so I kind of fell into what I was doing and um, continued on through high school playing soccer, on the, all through college, I went to the University of San Diego, uh, got an opportunity to play Division I soccer uh, from a great coach, uh, Seamus McFadden there, who's still there at this time. Uh, actually, my son, my oldest son played for him as well. So he's had two generations go through there. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a great experience all through. Um, again, there wasn't a lot, of, a lot of people at that time, kids playing soccer. But it's uh, it's actually taken off a lot more now. I see a lot a big difference. So, kind of that's how I got in, involved in it. So we're talking about now here. What was this like mid to late seventies when you kind of were first introduced to the game? This is the heyday of the NASL. Uh, was there a Las Vegas franchise in the NASL, or did you guys have much access to professional soccer when you were a kid? We really didn't. I actually um, we the uh, MISL was there. Uh, so that was, I was introduced to the indoor game. Uh, we did have the Quicksilvers back when I was growing up in the NSL. So we had, we had both, but I, I do remember more going to the, to the, uh, MISL games, the indoor, which was a little bit more popular. Um, cause it, that, um, uh, Julie B was one of the players that was, uh, one of the great players. So there's some old players around that I grew up watching. Um, but yeah, but that was, that was, uh, that was my youth watching professional soccer you mentioned you played multiple sports as a kid and that's you know certainly a conversation today in our game people talk about early specialization what's the right age how long should we encourage people to play multiple sports tell us about your experiences what were some of the other sports you're, you played how long did you play them and what ultimately led to your decision to focus primarily on soccer but uh, my, my parents are very very good at, in, in getting all the kids in, uh, involved in different sports that was one thing that I um have to really compliment them on is, is introducing several different sports to us. And I played basketball, I played baseball. Um, it was really soccer was one of those things that I, I think I, it was, wasn't a lot of people playing. So that was one game that I could excel at. So that was, uh, uh, I think it's really important though, that players do experience different sports at a young age and don't try to specialize as much. Uh, but yeah, that was one of the things that really helped me grow as a as a player, uh, experiencing other sports and, and had a great time doing it too. Terrific! So you're you're coming up as a youth player in Vegas. You get these opportunities and find your way to play at, at a Division One level at USD. <clears throat> Tell us about sort of your transition from being a player to you know you've now gone on and played in college. 
you played professionally indoor, am I correct, for a while after your college career? So take me from the end of your college playing days as then the, through the remainder of your playing career and then ultimately your decision to kind of transition out of being a player into other ways to serve our game. Well, yeah, I, I looked at several different colleges um, when, I was, when I was young. And when I, when I chose the University of San Diego, one of the, one of the things that attracted me to that, that area was San Diego is beautiful. I mean, and that game with soccer is played all year round there. Um, the coach was a, a very good coach, but I, I experienced a Division One soccer, which I, I felt like you know it was very important for me to, to experience that. But there's other there's other other avenues. People always focus on Division One. I. I think I would have I would have eventually ended up where I was or um, uh, playing professionally, even if I had gone to another school. Uh, but they did help me to help me grow playing at that at that level. Uh, when I graduated from college, the, I got an opportunity to. Uh, I got drafted, um, and uh, the coach that really helped me the most, um, besides my college coach, was Barry Bartz, who was coach at UNLV, where I grew up. Um, and so we had a relationship there, and he was on the he was actually on the committee for um, for submitting names for the the uh, MISL uh, draft. So I was put in the draft, and it ended up getting chosen to come to Kansas City, or actually it was Wichita at the time, for the uh, MLS um, draft. And we, that was it, that was back in 1989. So Wichita Wings, right? Wichita Wings was was hosting it. Um, it was a great experience for me. My first time in the Midwest uh, for a, a long period of time. We, my, my, we used to drive through, through the Midwest all the time on the way to, uh, uh, to the East, but that was a it was an interesting experience with snow. It was snowing at the time and very cold. And uh, but it was it was an eye opener for me because uh, it, it was it, it was a d- very different environment being in the Midwest for me coming from San Diego. Uh, wasn't a lot of diversity at the time there as well. So that was uh, was something that was very interesting to me to experience that. Uh, uh, ended up getting, getting uh, drafted by the Kansas City Comets in, in 1989 and ended up spending uh, a couple of years with them. Ended up folding, though, that the club folded, and, which was devastating to me because I wanted to continue my career uh, and uh, ended up eventually playing the MPSL uh, with the Atlanta moved here from uh, – and, and it became the Kansas City Comets, uh, or I'm sorry, they, they were the Kansas City Comets second team, um, played for them, and ended up my career in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but to see in the CISL. So I had, had a short career, but it was a great experience. So you come to the end of the playing career, Chris, and you're now you know still in your mid-20s at this point, late 20s, and you're ready to transition to the next place in life. You've been in Kansas City. You now came back to Kansas City. Was that a coincidence, or had had that become the place that you kind of had picked for your home moving forward? Well, having my family, uh, one of the things it wasn't a lot of money in uh, back in the days playing indoor soccer. We did a lot of traveling by vans and uh, buses, and uh, nowadays they fly everywhere. But it was I uh, had a family here in Kansas City, and I actually went to to support my family. I went I continued to play so. Ended up back in Kansas City and had to come up with a new uh, avenue for for uh, being involved in soccer uh, besides playing, and that's when I got into coaching. And it was what a great great transition that was playing the sport and then now coming in and trying to get back to some of the kids that were here in Kansas City that had actually watched me play. Um, so I had the connection there, which was great, was a great great feeling for me. So you're back in Kansas City. You're now transitioning. You, you still have the boots on, but it's to set down cones and hand out bibs and to run a practice plan. How did you find that transition? And from there, you went on a pretty, you know, interesting path from starting, you know, as a player, then a coach, and now into administration. So I want to start talking about that transition to the career still in soccer, off the field as we get to part two. But to wrap up part one here, tell us about your coaching career and how you know it went from your, those beginning days you're talking about as a coach back in Kansas City. So one of the things that um, inspired me to coach some of the coaches that I had growing up, I had a lot of great coaches in my, in my uh, 
my lifetime. And I, I learned a lot of different things from each coach. And I, I wanted to give back. And so I was asked by several different clubs here in, in Kansas City to, to help me coach. And uh, at first, it was one of those things where, you know, what, I'll give it, a, give it a try. I still have a little bit of the playing mentality in, in, in not so much coach. That was my my passion for the game. So it was it was it was a difficult transition uh, going from playing, especially still being young, into into coaching and, and trying to get back. So there's a lot I learned over over the time uh, in, in my coach, coaching career, which I look back at it now and I think, wow, it's if I were if I were to pick coaching up now again, and knowing what I know now compared to what I did then, it, I would have done a lot of different different things different uh, as a young coach so um, it was it was a it was a difficult transition but it was something that I adapted to and I feel like teaching is a, a big part of my personality as well so it did help it helped me grow as a person even even coaching other kids and so how did your career go from beginning as a coach to then ultimately leaving the field as a coach and, and moving into the office still in a soccer environment but moving into the office tell me about that transition one of the things that I, I, I wanted I wanted to make myself a little bit more well rounded as a as a, uh, a, a soccer professional, if you may. Um, and one of the things that uh, I had a, a great mentor here in Kansas City uh, who was also moving in that direction from from a player to a coach into the administrative piece, who's still involved in, in coaching. Which uh, Peter Vermees helped me actually do that when I had my club. So I, I learned a lot from him and I wanted to get that other piece uh, and, and find out what actually happens on the other side. There's a lot of the administrative side that I didn't see as a coach. Uh, and when I got into the administrative side, it was an, another eye opener uh, trying to deal with and the transition wasn't as easy as, as people would think, but that was, that was something that I felt like was another period in my life that I had to take on if I was going to make myself and help the game grow in this, in this uh, not only in the city, but in this country. So it was, it was very good for me to make that transition at the time. And it, it I was in coaching for probably, oh, shoot, uh, probably about 13 years before I actually went into the administrative side. So Terrific. Well, Chris, okay, we're going to take a little break here. We want to, again, thank everybody for joining us for TSSA Talks. This has been part one of our interview with Chris Duke. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk to Chris about that transition, his roles he served as he began as an administrator. We'll talk a little bit more about the program he now leads and how his journey has led him there. And then ultimately, you'll come back, hopefully, for part three, where we'll hear about Chris's views for the future of the game here in our country. Come back and see us here at TSSA Talks. We'll be back with you in just a couple of minutes.